My soul thirsts to you to understand the soul and the song of a people. One must understand where the people came from, where the people stand presently, and what is the destination of this people. Historical context is therefore extremely necessary. Today, we the Jewish people 
stand in the year Tovshin Samachtes, 5769 in the Hebrew calendar, 2009 in the secular calendar. To appreciate where we're coming from, where we stand, and where we're going, I think it is important and worthwhile to try to capture, if only briefly, some of the most important moments of the hundred years gone by, the past century. The century in which the Lubavitcher Rebbe lived, functioned, and taught. And to understand the great metamorphoses and changes that defined Jews and Judaism during this century. They tell the anecdote of the Israeli general, Israel's defense minister, Moshe Dayan, whom some of you remember, he had the patch on his eye from a wound yet in the 1940s. And he was once traveling on an Israeli highway, Kvish Mispar Echad, 145 kilometers per hour, which in Israel is not too fast, <laughs> unfortunately. A policeman stops him, Moshe Dayan, you ought to serve as a role model of Israeli society. You're driving like a madman. Your summons ought to be quadrupled. And Moshe Dayan turns to the officer and says, Adoni Shater, my dear officer, look at me. I have one eye. Now what would you like me to do with this eye? Look at the speedometer or look at the highway? <laughs> No. <laughs> now, I'm not going to be the nudnik in the crowd because they say that there are three types of Jews. There are shlemiels, shlemazels, and nudniks. Again, present company excluded. The shlemiel is the individual who pours the soup on the shlemazel. The nudnik is the guy who wants to know what type of soup was it. <laughs> I will not be the nudnik and ask whether Moshe Dayan got a ticket <laughs> or didn't get a ticket. But I will say that his answer is insightful. Because often in life we look at the speedometer, how fast or slow we're going and we fail to see the highway. The road ahead of us, our vision, our destination. So today, God graced us with what we call the GPS. <laughs> a little while ago, I was invited for a lecture in New Jersey. New York to New Jersey is not a very far journey. Besides the fact, of course, that the person who was hired to chauffeur me, to drive me, was a man, was allergic to the instructions by the GPS. <laughs> I assume because the person giving the instructions was a woman. <laughs> and Jewish men, Jewish men have a very, very hard time listening to their wives because they know it's usually right. <laughs> And it's a little difficult for their fragile egos. Since the GPS, its messages are uttered by a woman. So this person refused to listen to anything she said. Notwithstanding the timeless commandment in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, where God tells Abraham, Kol asher tomar elecha sara shma bekola. Whatever Sarah tells you, you should listen. And so... I gave her a name, the woman in the GPS, Mrs. Rosenberg. <laughs> Just sounded like Mrs. Rosenberg. She said, make a right, and this man made a left. <laughs> she said, it's two miles, and he said, it's three miles. The bottom line is, after two hours, we were on the way to California <laughs> instead of to New Jersey. 
We got so lost. I finally turned to him and I said, I don't understand you. Why can't you just listen? Obey the commandments of the GPS. And he tells me she's an anti-Semite. Look how lost she got me. I said, how can a Mrs. Rosenberg be an anti-Semite? He says, they're the worst. Self-hating Jew, she must be. I told him, but sometimes anti-Semites have it right. You know that. Sometimes you have to listen to what they say. Sometimes they just got it right. So finally I convinced them to listen. And we made it to New Jersey, albeit late. But I really felt bad for Mrs. Rosenberg because what she was doing throughout the whole time was repeating one word. Recalculate. The poor woman was recalculating, recalculating, recalculating again and again and again. But I did discover a profound lesson in life that night. And that is, even if you are lost, even if we are very lost, there will be somebody who will recalculate. Your soul, your God, your Rebbe, your mother, Mrs. Rosenberg. Somebody will recalculate, but there are two conditions. Condition number one is, you have to acknowledge where you are. And condition number two, you have to know where you're heading. Often, we look around and we feel lost, collectively and individually. But there is a GPS, God's positioning system. But two qualifications are necessary. We have to acknowledge where we are. And we have to appreciate where we are supposed to be heading. To understand where we are, we must know where we came and how we got here. The last century, the century of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, was probably the most dramatic, painful, bloody, and challenging century in Jewish history, such which did not exist in the previous thousand years, perhaps two thousand years, perhaps thirty-three hundred years. First of all, on a worldly level, the political upheaval which the 20th century has observed and experienced was unprecedented. Two world wars which shattered the planet and killed millions and millions of people. Totalitarian regimes which threatened to take over the world, beginning with the Russian Revolution, the Third Reich in Germany, Spain and Italy, ultimately all of them fell. The blood, the hatred, the violence created through Joseph Stalin, Adolf Hitler, in that century alone was unprecedented in all of human history from the day the world was created. Then, of course, there were the revolutions in areas of science, physics, psychoanalysis, and technology that were unprecedented. The whole field of psychology and psychoanalysis introduced by Dr. Freud. I hope I won't simplify it when somebody stated there are the three types of Jews. There is the psychotic the neurotic, and the psychiatrist. <laughs> the difference, the psychotic builds castles in the air. The neurotic lives in those castles. <laughs> the psychiatrist collects the rent from both. Are you a psychiatrist or a psychotic or a neurotic? Why is he applauding? Because you collect a lot of rent, huh? Recession ahead, recession ahead. Psychiatrists are busy. Baruch Hashem. At least somebody is not out of a job. <laughs> of course, 
the tremendous contribution of the theory of relativity, the development of the atom bomb, the unique revelations and discoveries in so many areas of science and physics, which created both tremendous hazards, threats, and opportunities, as well as a new literature which developed, a new modernity, a new sense of individualism, modernity, postmodernity, and so forth. But as dramatic as the transformation in the world at large during the 20th century, equally dramatic, if not more, were the changes in the Jewish world. And we can identify generally three major changes which redefined Jewish life and Jewish existence in the last century. Change number one, which began in the midst of the 1700s and gradually developed, it was not noticed by everybody at the time, but by the early 1900s it became quite clear and evident and really redefined Jewish history was the fact that while a few hundred years ago most Jews were more or less defined as observant defined by Jewish law, by Torah, by mitzvahs, by halacha. There were the exceptions, the Spinozas in town. But the mainstream of Jewish existence was defined by observance of Torah. A new wave and many trends in the world changed that to the point that millions and millions of Jews, as a result of enlightenment, as a result of new powerful isms, whether it was socialism or many other isms which captured the mind of so many young Jewish women and men, created a situation where at the time of the First World War, close to half, maybe half, maybe more than half of the Jewish people would not be defined as observant Jews. One drastic change. The second drastic change, of course, was the Holocaust. The Holocaust, which destroyed the core of the Jewish people, the most vibrant, active, conscious element of our people. Six million of them were exterminated. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of communities flourishing for more than a thousand years in five short years were decimated and destroyed. It redefined the state of the Jewish people and of Jewish history. And then, of course, there was the third major change in the last century, and that was the creation of the state of Israel, also an unprecedented phenomenon in the two preceding millennia. The Lubavitcher Rebbe lived in this century. Born in a Ukrainian-Russian city, Nikolaev, in 1902. He wasn't only a passive spectator of this most challenging, bloody, difficult century of Jewish life, but in many ways an active participant. Growing up in a Russia saturated with pogroms against the Jewish people and Jewish communities. Observing as a youngster the Russian Revolution of 1917 and ultimately the complete takeover by the Communist Party, Vladimir Lenin, and then 1924, Joseph Stalin, then relocating first to Berlin, studying in the University of Berlin, and then in 1933 after the rise of Hitler, when he became the Führer, the Chancellor of Germany, the Rebbe and his wife moved, relocated to Paris. We continued to study at the Sorbonne in France and Paris, observing firsthand the innovative discoveries and developments in science, physics, philosophy in Germany and France before the Second World War. 
a year in Nazi-occupied France and then rescued and arriving here in June 1941 from Lisbon to New York City, beginning to assist his father-in-law, the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, on the landscape of America, experiencing America in the 1940s, and then only five years after Auschwitz, assuming the throne of the Chabad Lubavitch movement in 1950, which he led for 42 years until his passing in 1994. 44 years until his passing on the 3rd of Tammuz, this year, June 25, 1994, towards the end of this century. I want to reflect for a few moments how the Rebbe responded internalized these three unprecedented changes in Jewish history in his own century. Crisis or challenge number one, the fact that already before the war, half of the Jewish people did not see themselves as the Am Torah, as a nation of Torah committed to Torah, never mind after a Holocaust, which left so many Jews confused, broken, dejected, filled with dilemmas and questions. You know, they tell that anecdote about the Jewish father who comes into the Hebrew school where his son David studies every Sunday. It's a Hebrew school of a particular temple. David, his father asks him, how are you enjoying Hebrew school? And David says, Daddy, it's great. David, are you studying? He says, Daddy, I'm studying. I'm studying very well. David, can you tell me, who broke the tablets? And David says, Daddy, it was not me. I did not break the tablets. The father is upset. He runs into the classroom. Mr. Cohen, are you the teacher of my son's class? Yes, I am. I just asked my son, David, who broke the tablets? And he tells me, it was not me. I didn't do it. What type of class do you run? And the teacher looks at him and says, sir, I know your son, David, now for seven months. If he said he didn't do it, he didn't do it. <laughs> An infuriated parent runs into the principal's office. Mr. Finkelstein, you're the principal of these kids? Of this school? Yes, I am. I asked my David who broke the tablets. He says, it wasn't me. I asked his teacher, Mr. Cohen, what is going on? He says, if your son said he didn't do it, he didn't do it. What type of school have you created here? And the principal looks at him and says, Sir, I understand you're extremely upset, and I understand and respect your frustration. Let me assure you one thing. On behalf of the administration of this school, we will recompensate you for the broken tablets. You just give us a receipt, and we will pay it up to the last penny. When they once asked a Jew what is the difference between ignorance and apathy, he said... I don't know and I don't care. <sighs> facing, facing a generation where there was often some ignorance and some apathy and sometimes a combination of both. The Lubavitcher Rebbe defined his response once in an unforgettable address, retelling that story in the Talmud at the end of tractate Makot, Makos. The Talmud relates the story how five of the great sages of Israel who lived in the era post to the destruction of the Second Temple, 
Shuv pa'amachas hayu oilun liyurishalayim. They were traveling to Jerusalem. When they came to Mount Scopus, Haratzofim, Karu Bigdeim, they rent their garments in sign of mourning. And then they came to the place where the temple once stood on the mountaintop. And at that moment, these sages, Ro Shuol Yoitze Mi Beis Kotche Hakadosh, they saw a fox coming out of that space which was once the Holy of Holies. They began to weep. Rabbi Akiva began to laugh. They turned to Rabbi Akiva and they said, Rabbi Akiva, why are you quelling? As a good Jew, you answer a question with another question. So Rabbi Akiva responds to them, why am I crying? Why are you weeping? And they respond, why are we weeping? That space upon which the Torah says, Hazar HaKarev Yumas, even an Israelite, was not allowed to enter into the Holy of Holies, only the high priest once a year on Yom Kippur. And now, look who hangs out there. A fox is coming out of the Holy of Holies. How can we not weep? And Rabbi Akiva responds and says, that is precisely why I'm quelling. That's why I'm laughing. He quotes two prophecies in the Hebrew Bible of the Tanakh. One reads, Tzion Sadate Kharish, Zion will be plowed like a field. Another one reads, Oid Yeshu Skenim Uskenes Berchavis Yerushalayim. There will yet come a time when elderly men and weeds of Jerusalem. And Rabbi Akiva said, until the second prophecy, until the first prophecy was not fulfilled, I was not sure whether the second prophecy will be fulfilled. But now that I see that the first prophecy was fulfilled, Zion was plowed into a field to the point that a fox comes running out of the Koda Shakadoshim of the Holy of Holies, I know that the second prophecy will be fulfilled. And the sages responded to him and said, Belashen Haza Amrulay, they told him these words, Akiva, Nichamtonu, Nichamtonu, you have consoled us. And the Lubavitcher Rebbe focused on one detail in the story, which may seem a bit irrelevant, but for him it was not irrelevant at all. Why a fox? So you might say, well, that's what happened. It was a fox. It wasn't a frog. It wasn't a mouse. It wasn't a weasel. It wasn't a cat. It was a fox. But the fact that the Talmud tells us this detail, the fact that the Talmud relates to us what animal it was is significant. That too is part of the story. That too is part of the lesson. There is another story about a fox. Elsewhere in Talmud, in Tractate Brachos, page 61. Also with the same figure, Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva, who was teaching Torah publicly, notwithstanding the decree of the Roman emperor that to teach Torah to the Jewish people is forbidden to the point that you will get the death penalty if you do it. And Rabbi Akiva was executed brutally by the Roman Empire. He was one of the ten martyrs, the Asara Ruge Malchut. And a colleague or another Jew, Papus, once asked him, Rabbi Akiva, aren't you afraid? Why are you teaching Torah to the Jewish masses? And Rabbi Akiva gave him the famous metaphor. And the metaphor is about the fox who's very hungry and he comes to the shore and he sees fish in the water. And he says, come fish, come out of the water and let's hang out and enjoy life together like my Zayd and your Zayd, they used to enjoy life together. And the fish said, you're a sugar. We live in the water. And he says, no, in the water you have to be scared of the fishermen who want to come and hop you and catch you. Come out of the water and we shall enjoy life. You will be secure, serene, tranquil. And the fish responded to the fox and they said, you are the fox upon whom the sociologists and the zoologists say you're the pikich shabachayis, you're the clever one of animals. It seems now that you're not very clever because if even in the place where we live, in the source of our life and oxygen water, we still have to be afraid of fishermen. How much more so if we leave the source of our life when we come to dry land, our death is a certainty. 
in water, we still have a chance to live. And Rabbi Akiva said, for the Jewish people, Torah is like water to the fish. It's their source of life. If even in the water we have to be concerned, if we leave the water, there's certainly no hope. So we have the fox in that story. The foxes, the pikeach shabachayas, the wise one, the clever one among the animals. Comes the Lubavitcher Rebbe and says, let's now go back to the story at the end of tractate Makos. Here again, there's a fox. This time the fox is coming out of Holy of Holies. It represents a trend and an idea. The fox represents the wisdom among the animals. It represents cleverness, wittiness, sharpness of intellect, but the level which the animal could reach. Here is the destruction that Rabbi Akiva and his colleagues are observing. They're not only observing physically a fox leaving the Holy of Holies. They're watching something much deeper. They're seeing a trend. Millions of Jews are leaving the Holy of Holies. They're going out of Kodesh HaKadoshim. They're bidding farewell to thousands of years of sacred traditions, values, studies, rituals, commandments, Torah. And who is guiding them? Who is leading them? The fox. The fox which employs intellectual arguments. The fox which brings to light and persuades these Jews and says, look at the intellectual future that awaits you if you leave the Holy of Holies. The challenge to the Jewish people, the first challenge described above, was above everything an intellectual challenge. New isms, new ideas in the area of philosophy, in the area of politics, in the area of religion, in the area of individuality, in the area of history, of sociology, of psychology, and so on and so forth. New trends, ideas, perspectives, philosophies coming from the fox, the clever of animals, were leading the masses out of the Kodesh HaKadoshim, out of the Holy of Holies to what seemed to them would be a new, more modern, engaging, promising horizon. Many sages weep. They watch the scene and they weep. They watch the crisis of the last century. Millions and millions of Jews who define themselves as non-observant only increasing after the Holocaust and with each year more assimilation, more alienation, more intermarriage. And they weep. Rabbi Akiva, Mesachik. Rabbi Akiva is Kvelik. Why is he Kvelik? And the way the Rebbe defined the voice of Rabbi Akiva was he turned to them and he said, My dear friends, there is another option. And I'll say it in Yiddish and then I'll translate. He said to them, why are you crying? Instead of weeping that they left the Holy of Holies, bring them back into the Holy of Holies. Show them the beauty, the majesty, the depth of Judaism. Explain to them the power of Yiddishkeit, the meaning of a mitzvah, the eternity of a blat gemara, of a page in Talmud. Show them what Judy of Holy is instead of crying, lamenting, crashing, groaning, and sighing. Bring them back into the Holy of Holies. Don't cry, but with joy and with laughter, show them the beauty of the Holy of Holies. Begin to rebuild a destroyed Holy of Holies. Interpreting those powerful words in Deuteronomy, in the Ten Commandments, the second set of ten, the second time the Ten Commandments are repeated in the portion of Eschana. Moses says, God spoke these Ten Commandments. It was a koil gadol v'lo yasaf. Koil gadol v'lo yasaf means 
a great voice, a powerful voice. V'loy Yosef. What does V'loy Yosef mean? So the Midrash explains one of the interpretations. His voice did not get tired, hoarse, exhausted. And the question is, is that really a big miracle with God? <laughs> would we expect that after ten commandments or nine commandments, God would get hoarse and say, I'm sorry, I have to go for voice lessons. I can't really continue. I'm dehydrated. Let me go get a drink. <laughs> and this is the miracle. Kail Gadol V'loy Yosef. He didn't have to enhance his voice because it was going strong. What is the meaning of this? But the way the Lubavitch Rebbe understood it was this. The voice of God very often seems hoarse, old, ancient, archaic, archaic. A new century came beginning in the mid 1700s, 1800s, especially the 1900s and said, the voice of God, the voice of Shabbos, the voice of Tefillin, the voice of Mikveh, the voice of Kashrut, the voice of Torah study, the voice of Jewish education, it's hoarse. It worked for a thousand years, two thousand years, three thousand years. But now it's getting dry. It's an old voice. You can hear the scratches. There's a new world order. There are new powerful developments. Comes the Torah and says, Koil Gadol V'loy Yosef. The relevance of Torah is timeless. Trends come and go like designer labels. For a few years they're in and then they go. Revelation, revolutions even, come and go. Revelation stands forever. The power of Torah is that it never betrayed the Jewish people. It never failed them. It speaks to a dimension of life and of history that is eternal and timeless. And thus, the Rebbe said, the core our calling in this generation, responding to crisis number one, is to look at the fish once again. You know, that image the Midrash gives, it's a fascinating image, that after a rain, if you go to the lake or the river, you'll always see lots of fish on the surface. Why? So the Midrash says, they come to drink the rainwater. And the Midrash asks, but they're submerged in water 24 hours a day. Why do they have to rise to the top to drink rainwater? And the answer given in the Midrash is, Zevilin Frisha Vasa. They're looking for fresh, fresh water. They need the freshness. They're looking for the freshness. Lubavitcher Ebra said, we can bring them all back into the Holy of Holies but you have to give them fresh water. In his brilliance, he knew how to articulate a Judaism that is relevant, exciting, and appealing to the contemporary Jewish woman and man who lives today and now. Very often what happened is the fox spoke in the name of excitement and contrasted it, contrasted it with the boredom and monotony with which religion was so often associated with. In my travels, people often ask me, what is the most important ingredient in a shul? And they always say, comfortable chairs. They say, why? They say, Jews come for Shabbos to shul, they want a shlof. So make sure there's comfortable chairs. There was a synagogue where the rabbi and the president didn't get along as is the custom in Jewish synagogues. So when the rabbi would get up, when the rabbi would get up to talk, the president, who also sits on the stage, on the other side, of course, would fall asleep immediately. And when the rabbi would begin hollering, he would begin snoring. It was almost rehearsed for 25 years. The gabai of the shul hated both of them. <laughs> So he decided it's time for revenge. Comes to the rabbi and says, Rebbe, you know it's a real chutzpah how your president sleeps during your sermon. The rabbi says, I agree, what do we do? The rabbi says, 
give me permission, next Shabbos, when you begin talking and he begins snoring, allow me to take a stick and knock him over his head. The rabbi says it's a brilliant <coughs> and deeply moral idea. Great. Shabbos comes. The rabbi starts talking. The president starts snoring. The rabbi goes over with a bat. Tarach right over his head. The president wakes up, looks at the rabbi and says, do it again. The rabbi is like, why? The president says, I could still hear him. You see, <laughs> a rabbi once shared with me, a rabbi once shared with me, friends, that when he gets up to talk Saturday, so there's a man sitting in the front row, who without exception, takes his nap. Every single week, the rabbi starts talking, and this man starts sleeping. 25 years. Quarter of a century, they both grew old by the time this happened. One Shabbos, the rabbi was walking up to the podium. He hasn't started yet. And the old man, whose name was Berkowitz, started to snore already. So the rabbi couldn't tolerate this disrespect. He screams out, he says, Berkowitz, I've been silent for 25 years. I understand you. I begin talking. You sleep. You think I'm monotonous. I'm boring. I don't have anything to say. Fine, I understand. I can respect that. But this week, I didn't even start yet. <laughs> I'm just walking up, approaching the podium. Vashlovsta, why are you sleeping already? And he looks up and he says, Rabbi, I trust you. <laughs> and so, in a generation, in a generation which experience Judaism often as very shallow, boring, monotonous, irrelevant to the human spirit and to the real challenges that face us as human beings and as Jews. The Rebbe had the unique genius through his teachings and writings and talks and addresses and letters and discourses to articulate Judaism in a manner that is relevant, meaningful, exciting, fresh, and inspiring. Whether it comes to biblical narratives, Talmudic laws, legal debates in Maimonides, philosophical doctrines, Kabbalistic, esoteric dimensions, Jewish history, Talmudic legal issues, and all fragments and aspects of Jewish thought to be able to weave them in a fashion that can show the Jew that the Torah actually constitutes the very DNA of the Jewish people. And therefore, as far as we traveled, and as far as we got lost, and as millions of Jews that have left, their DNA doesn't change. The Torah is the blueprint which captures the soul, the rays in the etra, the essence, the mission statement, and the various colors and mosaic of the Jewish soul. Torah is the most natural, deepest voice of the Jew. But the fish are looking for fresh water. So watching the fox leaving the Holy of Holies and taking with him millions and millions and millions, so many stood and wept. And the Rebbe learned from Rabbi Akiva to stand up and say, Vos Vainter, why are you crying? Mesachik, don't groan and sigh. Bring Zeitzurik in Kaidesh Akadashim. Bring them back into the Holy of Holies. Demonstrate to them what Yiddishkeit is, what Torah is. Allow them to see that every ism failed. Every ism came and went. 
It appealed to the world for 50 years, for 100 years, for 500 years. But where is Rome today? Where is Greece? Where is Assyria? Where is Egypt? In Wikipedia. <laughs> but Zvachim and Nachas, Chulin, Shabbos, Torah, Mitzvahs are not in Wikipedia. They're right here this evening with tens of thousands of Jews here in the world over and in the whole world, in the Holy Land and abroad. Chayim kol chemayim. They're alive, they're vibrant. In 1972, when he turned 70, the New York Times interviewed the Rebbe of Lubavitch. And the reporter asked him a question. Would you define yourself as a conservative or a liberal? You like the question, huh? It's a Jew with a white beard, a black hat, a black coat, a Rebbe. Are you a liberal or a conservative? <laughs> and the Rebbe responded, he said, a liberal I'm not. But I am also not a conservative. And the man said, what do you mean? Your ethos, your philosophy is to hold on to the old traditions, to the ancient laws, not to make reforms and changes. Of course you're a conservative. He says no. The word conservative by definition means to conserve. Something is getting old. It's going to become uh, decadent. It's going to decay. So we have to hold on to it. We have to conserve it. That even as the new trends become popular, we still hold on to the old. But from my perspective, from my vision, to say that the Torah Judaism is old is not true. The most modern, fresh commentary on what is going on today, you will find in Torah. And the reason is, although it was written thousands of years ago, but since it was authored, by the source of history, by God, who's omniscient. So in the wisdom of Torah, you have encompassed every milieu, every development, historically, philosophically, politically, psychologically, and sociologically. In the infinity of Torah, you have all of history. And when you look into the Torah, you can glean the most fresh, contemporary insights that is relevant today to the person who is in touch with what is going on today. This was the first response of the Lubavitcher Rebbe to the first major crisis that defined the last century of Jewish history, the crisis of alienation, of assimilation. In one word, Instead of crying, bring them back to the Holy of Holies. It remains our calling today as well. L'chaim, l'chaim, l'chaim v'levracha to one and all. And now we will continue with number two and number three. But of course, instead of interrupting me, harmonize with me. Ah. Uh -huh.
L'chaim, dear friends, good evening and welcome once again. Welcome to everybody here, to the hundreds who are here with us locally in the Crystal Plaza, with Lubavitch of Essex County. Welcome to all of you, and welcome to close to 150 communities that are joining us here tonight around the world. And a little later, I will announce the names of all of these communities which are now coming in through the web, joining us here for this evening, a soul, the soul and song of our people, in tribute to the 15th yard site of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. I want to especially thank my dear friends who allowed this evening to happen, David and Ida, Schattenstein, L'chaim, and God bless you and all of you. L'chaim, L'chaim, please join me and say L'chaim. So, we come now to the second crisis and the second response. A while ago, I attended a conference, and the subject of the conference was Jewish continuity and, of course, anti-Semitism. And somebody raised his hand and said, Rabbi Jacobson, I want to ask you a question, sure. Can you explain to me what is the difference between a Jew and an anti-Semite? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, they both don't like Jews. <laughs> so I told him, I said, let me tell you the difference between a Jew and an anti-Semite. You come to an anti-Semite, and we're talking here about the civil anti-Semite. They say in the name of Churchill, I'm not sure he said it, but somebody said it, that the definition of an anti-Semite is somebody who hates Jews more than necessary. So I'm not talking about somebody who hates Jews more than necessary, I'm talking about somebody who in his mind hates Jews as much as necessary. A civil anti-Semite. <laughs> and you come to him and you say, tell me, what is your opinion of the Jewish people? And naturally he'll tell you, greedy, selfish, Horrible, horrible people. They're guilty for all of the problems in the world. Afghanistan, Darfur, Iraq, Libya, the Middle East. It's all their fault. The economy, of course. They're horrible, horrible people. And you'd ask the anti-Semite, one second. Your cardiologist is Dr. Goldberg. He's Jewish. And he'll say, yeah, Goldberg is different. He's an exception. But your lawyer is Mr. Cohen. 
He's Jewish. Uh, he's an exception. I know him for 40 years. But your accountant is Rosenstein. He's also Jewish. Uh, he's an exception. I know him for 29 years. He's an honest man. But your barber is also Jewish. Mr. Klein. Uh, he's a great guy, my barber. And your neurologist is Eichayid. Uh, he's a unique character. <laughs> but what about the Jewish people? Bacteria. <laughs> Vermin of the earth. That's an anti-Semite. Now you come to a Jew. Ask any Jew, what is your opinion of the Jewish people? The Jew will say, ah. Jewish people, Micha Amcha Yisrael, where do you have such a beautiful, blessed, and holy nation? I love the Jewish people. Tell me, what do you think about your neighbor in Shul? <laughs> a ganev, a thief. How about your other neighbor? A liar, a shakran. How about your brother in law? Don't trust him with a dollar, he'll pickpocket you. How about your mother-in-law? Don't even get me going. How about your rabbi, your president, your gabai? You don't want to know about them. If I would only talk, they would be sitting tomorrow. <laughs> what is your opinion of the Jewish people? I love the Jewish people. So you see, one of them hates the Jewish people, but he likes individual Jews. That's the anti-Semite. For the Jew, it's easy to love the Jewish people. But individual Jews, it's a little harder to love. <laughs> it's easy to love Kalal Yisrael. It's difficult to love Reb Yisrael. The collective body of the Jewish people we can embrace. The individual Reb Yisrael or Rebetzin Yisrael is a little harder to embrace. And here I come to the second response, or at least one of the responses of the Rebbe, to the second most important event of the last century, and in many ways the defining event of millennia in Jewish history, the Holocaust. And I know present here in this room right now are individuals who were there, survivors who were in Auschwitz, who were in Dachau, who were in Treblinka, who were in Bergen-Belsen, joining us here this evening, physically in this room, as well as on the web around the world. And one of the key points In the Rebbe's approach to this black hole of humanity, to this unprecedented and incomprehensible tragedy amongst our own people, one and a half million children in the gas chamber, killed in the gas in the gas chambers, went up in the crematoriums. But one of his responses was. This ought to teach us a thing or two about loving every individual Jew. As the Rebbe once put it at a Purim gathering, at a Purim Fabrengen, at an assembly of Hasidim in honor of the joyous holiday of Purim, he said, let's dissect for a moment what happened. The hatred of Hitler was directed even to the Jewish infant. How can you hate a baby? How can you possibly hate a baby? You can't accuse a little child of being on the wrong side of politics, of being a capitalist, or being a communist. You can't accuse a child of holding on to the wrong territory, of being a territorialist. You can't accuse a child in wrong ideology. He or she is an infant. And yet, the venom and hatred displayed 
to the smallest and cutest of angelic Jewish children was incomprehensible. The glee, the joy, the passion, the gusto which the Germans employed in exterminating every last Jew to the smallest child. To the point, to the point that he averted, he used precious resources that were needed for the war effort, that were necessary to fight the war. And he used those precious resources just to make sure that a one another Jew and another Jew would be exterminated. And if you were to tell him there's one Jewish child left in some little shtetl in Galicia or in Poland or in Hungary or in Ukraine, a little shtetl, a little child, he would make sure to send somebody to go and hunt down that child and cleanse the world, quote unquote, from the curse of the Jew who gave the world the conscience, as Hitler and Marshall might put it. Came the Lubavitcher Rebbe, who himself lived through the war and lost many of his own family members in the Holocaust, including a brother, grandmother, sister-in-law, brother-in-law, and many other family members, and said, how can you hate a child so much? But it means that he saw something, he saw a power, he saw a sacredness, he saw a depth in a Jewish child. For him, as long as one Jewish child was alive, it meant that God was alive, it meant that Judaism was alive, it meant that the Jewish people was alive, it meant that something very grand, which he needed to exterminate, was alive and well. Came the Rebbe and said, if every young, if every Jewish child was Jewish enough, was sacred enough, was powerful enough, that Hitler would hunt him down in hate, should we, the Jewish people, not look at every Jewish child and see him or her as holy enough, as precious enough, as sacred enough to embrace him or her with love. Aim. It has been suggested, his mission statement. 65, 70 years ago, every Jew was hunted down in hate. No Jew was too small. No Jew was too insignificant. No Jew was too irrelevant. No Jew was inconsequential. Every single Jew represented a certain power, which in the eyes of the Germans meant he or she needed to be exterminated. So the Rebbe said, our challenge, our calling is to take that energy and redefine it and transform it. Do not look at a Jew as insignificant or inconsequential that you cannot love him and embrace him and reach out to him or her. Don't say that because in these flung, this far-flung Jewish community there are only a few Jews. It's not large enough for us to spend valuable resources and reach out to them. Seventy years ago they were reached out to and hunted down to be exterminated. Our calling is to take that same energy and redefine it in the positive. To be able to reach out to every single Jew without exception with endless and infinite affection and love. Embrace him or her with all our heart and all our soul. And restore them to their rightful dignified place in the structure of Knesset Yisrael, of the community of Israel. You remember perhaps that moment in Amadeus Mozart conducts a symphony and Emperor Joseph, the Emperor of Austria, comes to participate. I think he was a little tone deaf. So what do you do if you're tone deaf and you're at a symphony? It's called schlaf. You take a nap as discussed earlier. So he had a schlaf. He slept through the symphony. Mozart finishes. 
And as he's walking out, the emperor says, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, job well done. But too many notes. You have to get rid of a few. Right? It's like when they tell me, Rabbi, excellent, but too long. Too many notes, cut it down. And I tell them the advice I heard from a priest. He once said, he was once giving a speech Sunday morning. And he came bandaged. His whole face was bandaged. So he explained to the crowd. He said, this morning I woke up. I decided I'm going to take a nice shave for the sermon. And as I was cutting my face, as I was, uh, I was, I was thinking about my speech, I was shaving. So as I was thinking about my speech, by mistake, I cut my face. It happened. That's why I'm bandaged. So a child raises his hand and says, dear father, next week, do us all a favor. And reverse the process. Think about your face and cut your speech. (laughs) There was a rabbi, like many rabbis, who knew when to begin but didn't know when to end. So he went on and on and on and on. Finally, everybody evacuated the shul. Everybody, besides one person. Finally, the rabbi finishes, he goes over to this guy and he says, you know, I'm so sorry for going so long. And thank you for sticking it out with me. I apologize for the length of my speech. But what should I do? There was no clock on the wall. The man says there was no clock on the wall, but there was a calendar on the wall. (laughs) 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 and so the emperor tells Mozart job well done but too many notes couldn't you cut a few and Mozart responded and he said nay nay your majesty there was not a note too many which one do you suppose I cut a true composer can indeed testify that there's not a note too many. Which one do you suppose I cut? That metaphor is used in Kabbalah and Jewish mysticism to describe humanity and to describe the Jewish people. Each of us constitutes a singular note in a divine symphony, and there is not a note too many. Which one do you suppose I cut? Which means you and you have something to contribute to the melody of the world and to the melody of Jewish history and to the melody of God that nobody before you and nobody after you will be able to contribute. It's your indispensable melody. It's easy in our generation to come out with slogans that we have to love the Jewish people. It's easy to talk about Jewish continuity. Anybody here who attends dinners, if you have the great misfortune to attend Jewish dinners like myself and listen to speeches, <laughs> if you have the great fortune to attend Jewish conferences and summits every Monday and Donnerstag, every Monday and Thursday, by the 1,099 Jewish organizations in the metropolitan area, If you have the fortune or the misfortune, you know that the word Jewish continuity, saving the Jewish future, saving the Jewish people. We have to save Klal Yisrael, save the Jewish people. Here was the brilliance of a leader. The Lubavitcher Rebbe came to his disciples and pupils and students and anybody who wished to listen to him and he said, My dear Yidin, stop saving the Jewish people and don't worry about Jewish continuity. This is what I want you to do. You have a neighbor... Reach out to your neighbor. You have somebody who works in your office. Invite her or him for Shabbos. The Jewish people are made up of individual Jews. Men, women, and children. Touch one heart at a time. Embrace one soul at a time. Kindle one spirit at a time. Increase one mitzvah at a time. Learn from the greatest evil man in history. That there's no such a thing as a small Jew. 
There's no such a thing as an insignificant Jew. There's no such a thing as a worthless Jew. As a Jew not worthy enough or not holy enough or not religious enough for you to spend time and energy with. The hate that they expended 70 years ago, you expend the same energy in love. To every single one, without exception. I recall the last words I heard from my Rebbe before he fell ill in 1992. The Lubavitcher Rebbe had a custom that every Sunday he would distribute dollars for charity. Whoever wished came, took a dollar to give to charity and gave a blessing. He once explained his custom. Why a dollar to everybody? You know, it adds up. Usually, you'll excuse me, usually rabbis and rabbis like taking dollars, not giving dollars. <laughs> and not for bad reasons. They have to support institutions. <laughs> Costs money, right? You know, the rabbi got up in front of the shul and said, Rabbi Yisai, my dear friends, there's a hole in the roof of the synagogue. There's good news and bad news. The good news is we have all the money to repair it. The bad news is the money is in your pockets. <laughs> this was a commercial for Lubavitch of Essex County. <clears throat> <laughs> that was a word from our sponsors, Rabbi Klar, Rabbi Kasowitz. The Rebbe would give dollars and add it up every week. I was the nudnik. I once asked one of his secretaries, how much? <laughs> He said, a nice amount of money. It could be $7,000, $10,000. Lots of Jews would come by every single Sunday. He said, Nishkin Kleina Madbeya. Right? Why? And the Rebbe once said, I heard this from his mouth once on a Shabbos, he said, I heard from my father-in-law. When two people meet, even if the meeting lasts only four seconds, they have to make sure that during those four seconds, a favor comes out from it to a third person. If you and I meet, we have to make sure that a third person benefits. It's not just about you and I. So every person he met, he gave a dollar to give to somebody in need to charity. And so it was Sunday afternoon, around 6.30 p.m. I was traveling to the Holy Land that day, that night, for a wedding. So I, growing up in Crown Heights in Brooklyn, I usually would not go take a dollar every Sunday because I was a native, as they say, a local. But that Sunday, traveling to the Holy Land, I went online. It was already towards the end of the line. The Rebbe was standing for more than seven hours. And this was a man who was uh, 89 years old. He wasn't 19, he was 89. Men, women, children, religious, non-religious, observant, non-observant, all types, all stripes, all colors, Ashkenazim, Svardim, Yeshivish, Litvish, Chabad, not Chabad, Chassidish, not Chassidish, Lahavdal, non-Jews, all types. In front of me there was a little girl. I'll never forget the scene. She stood out because she was young, maybe six, seven. Bekelach, cute cheeks. The way she was dressed, I saw she was not from what they would call a Hasidic family. I don't know where her parents were, whether they went already or they were in back, but she happened to be right in front of me. And she was adorable. She just has this, this cute, adorable face. And it was her turn, she went by to the Rebbe. And the Rebbe gave her a dollar and told her, Bracha v'hatzlacha, blessing and success. And she looked at him and she said, I love you. Some of the Rebbe's secretaries froze. They were unaccustomed to that lingo. As you can well understand. One of them even got a little upset, I think. But the Rebbe began smiling. And smiling in a way that I've never seen before. I've had the fortune of seeing him smile many times in my life. But the way I saw the Lubavitcher Rebbe smile that day was unique. He was quelling. His face was radiating literally from ear to ear. There was a luminescence, 
a graceful luminescence on his holy countenance. It was something special. And she moved on. She said what she wanted to say, and she moved on. And the Rebbe called her back. And when she came back, he gave her an extra dollar. And gazing at her with his glowing, pure, innocent, blue eyes, untarnished by 89 excruciatingly difficult years, he looked her in her innocent, youthful eyes, and giving her the second dollar, he told her a few words. This is for the love. And she went on, and then came my turn, and his face grew stern. <clears throat> you're, la you're laughing now, but then it wasn't so funny and serious. And when his secretary told me that I was traveling to the Holy Land, he gave me also a second dollar and told me to give it for charity in the Holy Land. The next day, Monday, praying at the resting place of his father-in-law, the sixth Lubavitcher Rebbe in the Montefiore Cemetery in Queens, New York, Lubavitcher Rebbe suffered a stroke from which he never recovered and passed on two years later on the 3rd of Tammuz, June 1994. Those were the last words I heard from my Rebbe. This is for the love. And in my imagination, they captured one of his responses to this unfathomable crisis in Jewish history, the Holocaust. The hate that was expended ought to be now transformed and the same energy be redefined as love towards every single Jew in every single location in the entire world. And now you can hear this message in the words of the Master himself, in the words of the Lubavitcher Rebbe himself, at a gathering of 1961. He spoke in Yiddish, but here it's translated into English. I have today signed an executive order providing for the establishment of a Peace Corps on a temporary pilot basis. I'm also sending to Congress a message opposing authorization of a permanent Peace Corps. This call will be a pool of trained men and women sent overseas by the United States government or through private institutions and organizations to help foreign countries meet their urgent needs for skilled manpower. It is our hope to have between 500 to 1,000 people in the field by the end of this year. We will send Americans abroad who are qualified uh, to do a job. We will send uh, those abroad who are committed to the concept which motivates the Peace Corps. It will not be easy. None of the men and women will be paid a salary. They will live at the same level as the citizens of the country which they're sent to, doing the same work, eating the same food, speaking the same language. We're going to put particular emphasis on those men and women who have skills in teaching, agriculture, and in health. I'm hopeful that it will be a source of uh, satisfaction to Americans and a uh, contribution. Dossi was a given idea in Zeitung Nächten, the high in the Nächten, as the Saar Hamedine, Tutor the Horn in the Meshul Hamedine, or tell me dear given, as me gay to Samistel, a ganze Kwutze, was a rinne nizain, a se und das na weglosen. Me yat atzecho, me ladetecho, me beisa vicho, on a wegfahren in a fremden Nord, on in a zami Nord, was er nicht entwickelt. On a dorten wird er davon helfen, jene sich a wegstellen und entwickeln sich, und helfen sie aufbauen, weil sie ihr Seder a chayim, ki die Beu. 
und hat gleich mäßig gewählt. Aber wir soll wissen sein, aber ich schaue mit dahin zu fahren. Letten dort und davon leben in derselben Neue wie jene leben. Und essen derselbe Maicholi, was jene essen. Und wir soll nicht meinen, dass der Fahrwett mit Zoll, Schum im Gdelim, nur oder sie sein Ongeld, oder sie sein für eine Maske des Gtaner, für kleine Gehalt. Und hat gleich ich es mäßig gewesen, als er hofft, er ist sicher, als er es oben kam, und er kam, und mir ist er noch. Al Peter, als Kohl hat, als Bereich ist, wie schwierig Reuel, ist er das Einigen auf der Monen und auch das, wegen was wird mit uns gerät. Und nur was Ilo Zachino, Wollten das mit keinem gewinnen, gleich wie Mord wegen der Ruf gerät, wie Schaß als Leser Chino ist Bechesed und Brachmi. Wird das gedruckt in Zeitung auf Englisch, und mir hofft, als Kollechet wie Echet wird das übersetzen, auf Essische Benafsche, und wird verstehen, dass das Mind mir nicht mehr lebt. Und das, was am meisten in etlichen Jahren am Erhalten nie reden. Er soll mir sich nicht einreden von Tu, Horitz, Techelo, als Gefinne der Dafke in Notre Dame und die etlichen Gassen. Und was dort in der Radio und Television und jeder Tag frische Milch und jeder zweimal an der Früh einmal auf Schauer und bei Nacht das zweite Mal auf Schauer und hat nicht in Deiges von Cholo wie Srolo, von Passi Srolo, und hat er da viele der Mäbischen dienen und von da nicht riet er sich nicht. Und ich schaue es mir, kommt er zu gehen, und ich sage dem Herr Zachai, sie da am Edin noch erreve, am Edin, was sie noch nicht entwickelt, und hat er da gefunden, dass er hieden, was sie wissen nicht, dass sie fällt er bis. Bischar dus gehad de hatzloche le meile mi dere chateva nid gehor viter heit, no vi mezog dem loschen ashreinu ma tev chalkeinu ma jopi yerusha tseinu, fatayster der alte reba das al derech vi yerusha nid gehor viter heit, anuber benye, anuber atinik benye me achere sheite de koten izreche ta yerish, nid gehor viter heit. Gib ob a por jor zeit, a vif und mit dir darf nur hoben, fort zu a jeden, wo sehr nicht nur ein Feld, nur er weiß a viele nicht a sein Feld, und sei dort na a Tag, a Woche, a Chedesch, a Jor, zehn Jor, der Rebester und Schneeser lehi tomu, und wie viel Jor mit darf nur hoben, a Farbeten wird er dir dort geben, und von deinen Jahren wird gar nicht nicht fehlen. Ist am meisten Jahren noch ein Land. Aber mir sagt, dass sie nicht signieren und in der zweiten signieren und in der dritten signieren. Ist dort die Rutsche, wie steht in Megille, Kehle mit Kehle im Schöne. Allerlei mit Schöne Dicke Israel. Aber bin nicht weg von dem Ort, weil kann haben jeder Tag frische Milch. Und nicht bedacken sie das, es war kein Sein versichert, als er kein Nies für den Holo wie es rollt und passt es rollt, sich nicht davon absagen von mir. Oder sich nicht davon stellen in die Säule. Was sie sein mit den Kontrollen, die dort noch nicht entwickelt, soll ein anderer Deigen wegen geben. Wer nicht mit dem Kuh versorgen, der mehr bis nicht will. Ist auch der Koschkin, der Kalwache, mit jeder Farbe, was man hat ihm gegeben, Pchira. Was wir sagten, die Kutetere, für was hat er jeden Pchire, der Farbe, was er nimmt sich von Nazmus und Maus in Solbaruchu, was das ist der einzige Rot, wo sie dort Pchire kaufen. Nichts der Reis, Reische shall never, und die Tchune, was er hat, mit Zadru, was Kol Israel und Melochim heim, auf was, auf nicht es für noch dem Kruz, was Jotzom im Alke Schelelom, an der Habal Schemte, was Abbas Israel, in das Zuhaiden, was gefühlt sich bei Katzwe Tevel, wenn man er das Kehmol nicht gesehen hat. 
Und ich weiß, weil er nicht mehr ist, aber es ist Reul, ich stehe, weiß nicht. Die Kunst in der Stadt, wo Hafter, der Jacho, Komecho, meint mir, wie er Hafter, das Liebe haben, und mir meint, der Jacho, nicht dir, meint mir, nur den Zweiten, und Komecho, sie da ist ein Punkt, da sehe ich, wie du hast, lieb sich. Und auch das ist ein Gewinn, Jörn nach Hanan, das muss das Gerät mit Beile Pchiro, bis wann nicht muss er der Warte, muss er so gedrückt in der Zeit der Fingers, und das ist geworden ein Jinni, wo das in die Spaß sind, und wie mir sagt dort, das ist geworden ein Madernsach. Ist wie hier rot sind, mit der Heere Simcha, wie so sind wie ich kor, Sollen wir mit keinem sein, nur das, was mir Tiber gegeben hat, durch dem, was sie nicht kein Beil Pchiro, zu dir, was sie sein, in Jo Beil Pchiro, und sollen sie auch nicht mit Jaschig sein, mit dem, was sie wissen, als er jetzt sie sagen, als sie sein in der Fum Potter, und er allein weiß sich, dass er sagt sie, nicht wie die Meisse ist, und auch zu dem, was ich weiß nicht, was er ein Gehalt mit sie geben, und was sie um dort essen, und was sie um dort trinken, Ein Sach, was sie betuach, als sie gehen dahin, sie beschlichusse, schon mochim, wo der Rebischter hat sich herangegeben, sein Navas, Hashem, mein Navas ist reu, wie der Baal Shem Tiv sagt, und mit hat er die beide Ahavis, Hamuchodis, Durachavas, Hatero, wie ha Mitzvo, wird mir Naro bringen, die Geulo ha Mitzis, wo sie hat mir Wattel sein, dem Golos, wo sie gekommen hat, alle die, Sinas Chinom, und er robring in die Geulo, was ist kommen alle die Ahava. Lechaim, Lechaim. Ha ha ha! 
Brothers and sisters, we are joined here tonight with 300 cities from across the world, 300 cities and communities from across the world joining us here this evening with Lubavitch of Essex County here in the Crystal Plaza in Livingston, New York. I stand corrected, a very bad Freudian slip. Oive, the de which death penalty? Please join me in saying l'chaim to all of us, to all of the Jewish people. L'chaim, l'chaim, l'avracha. I want to welcome the community of Cape Town, South Africa. They'll be. Ch <laughs> and St. Kilda, Australia, and Zurich, Switzerland, and Haifa in the Holy Land. Rottesler, Belgium. Imperatriz, Brazil. Vancouver, British Columbia. Herzliya. The community in Herzliya in the Holy Land, Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, Irakaydesh, Guatemala City, London, Bandai in Australia, the Gold Coast in Australia, Burmuth, England. I don't know what time it is in all of these places. They must be having a late night, some of them. Huh? Santiago in Chile, Lima, Peru. Like Argentina, Argentina. <laughs> Gonzalez in Argentina, Johannesburg in South Africa, Melbourne, Sydney, Abbotsfield, Abbotsfield in Canada, in British Columbia, Stoneham, Massachusetts, Brookline, Massachusetts, Faxborough, Massachusetts, Peabody, Massachusetts, Detroit, Michigan. Bowie, Maryland, Pampana Beach, Florida, Jacksonville, Florida, Kansas City, Bloomfield, New Jersey, Bergantine, New Jersey, Nishgahert, Bergantine. This Bergantine? Bringantine, Lechayim, I stand corrected. Laurel, Maryland. Laurel, Maryland. Mississauga, Ontario, Canada, wow. Scottsdale, Arizona, Freehold, New Jersey, Buffalo, New York, Philadelphia, Houston, Cincinnati, Columbus, Ohio, and thank you, David and Ida, once again. God bless you. Kansahokan, Pennsylvania. I have to study some geography. Nutley, New Jersey, Glenridge, New Jersey, Lakewood, New Jersey. I heard of that city. Suffer in New Jersey. <laughs> Suffer in New York. I give out. That was I was just trying to atone for my other sin. <laughs> Wappingers, Falls. Wappingers Falls, New York, Long Beach, California, California Moore Park, California, Toronto, Montreal, Los Angeles. You ever heard of a Jewish community? Crown Heights, Crown Heights, New York, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, Chicago. Torrance in California, Maplewood in New Jersey, Newton in New Jersey, Bronx, Rio, Rio in Brazil, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, Materi, Louisiana, 
Colts Neck, New Jersey, East Orange, New Jersey, Hollywood, Florida, West Palm Beach in Florida, Boynton Beach, Florida, Ottawa in Ontario, Tornill in Ontario. No, bus, what's that cities. <laughs> it's now 340 cities and they're gathered together and I feel it's appropriate to acknowledge and welcome all of you out there in the world. Westville, Connecticut, Mount Olympus, California, Westminster, Colorado, Teaneck, New Jersey, Columbia, South Carolina, the Den Denver, Denver Jewish Center, Shalah House in Brighton, Massachusetts, Annapolis, Maryland, Western Florida, Albany, New York, Brandon, Florida, West Parkland, Pinellas County, Berkeley, California, so we did that. Monroe, Monroe Townships, Fox Chapel, Pennsylvania, Delray, Florida, Poughkeepsie, New York, Sunny Isles Beach in Florida, Sharon, Massachusetts, West Hempstead, West Hempstead, Naperville, Florida, Marion, California, Atlantic City, New Jersey, Guilford in Connecticut, Venice, Florida, Moore Park, California, East Valley, Arizona, or South Orlando, Florida, San Antonio, Texas, Manalapan, New Jersey, Fairlow, New Jersey, Cup County, Georgia, Mid-Hudson Valley, Upper Montgomery County, Chestnut Hill in Massachusetts, Chabad of Kendall, Florida, and Mason, Ohio, and St. Paul, Minnesota, as well as uh, Tzvas, the holy city of Tzvas. In the Holy Land, Bruchim Aboyim, welcome, welcome to all of you. L'chaim, l'chaim, l'avrocha. Let's hear it for Jews, tens of thousands of Jews the world over. <laughs> My dear friends, They tell a story that a few years ago, when our economy was still doing pretty well, but the Israeli econ economy was failing miserably. And the Israeli parliament had an emergency meeting. What do we do to help build up the Israeli economy? And different Jews gave different suggestions. And then one Knesset, one Jew, Israeli parliament member said, I have a great idea. My idea is that we, Israel, declare war on the United States of America. America will then destroy us completely, as they have once destroyed completely Japan and Germany. But then America will rehabilitate us and turn us into an economic superpower as the United States once rehabilitated Japan and Germany. So we declare war, we get destroyed, and then we become a major economic force. And one Knesset member raised his hand and says, but friends, there's one problem. What happens if we win the war? <laughs> And here, friends, we come to the third issue, one of the three defining components of the last century, namely the reality of Israel. The reality of Israel, there are those of you who remember still those days in 1948 or the aftermath of 1967. But after Auschwitz and Bergen-Belsen, the fact that Jews could come back to their homeland, now governed by Jews themselves with their own infrastructure and with their own military, was and is a great pride and blessing for the Jewish people. Came the Rebbe, and while others dedicated their lives to establish the Jewish state. The Lubavitcher Rebbe understood very well that for the Jewish state, 
to be healthy and vibrant, the state of the Jews must be healthy and vibrant. Meaning, it's not only enough to establish a Jewish state, we have to also reestablish the Jewish soul and give it its inner sense of harmony and wholesomeness. Because he understood that Jewish statehood without an internal sense of what it means to be Jewish can ultimately create a generation of young Jews who will reject the very foundations of Zionism and ideological passion that characterized their parents and grandparents, deprived of an inner understanding and awareness of what it means to be a Jew. What does it mean to live in the land of Israel? What is the land of Israel? What is our relationship to the land of Israel? Ultimately, with the tremendous pressures and surrounded by such hostile country. As a historian once said about Israel, he said, Israel is a good country, it's a great country. It's just in a bad neighborhood. But when you're in a bad neighborhood, you have to be able to have the resources. Not only militarily, certainly militarily, but psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually. You have to have a soul. Israel and the Jewish people need a soul. Because if not, what happens is what we have seen in our own generation. You want to know what a Jew is? A Jew makes a fist. And what's the next step after the fist? A shamnu, bagadnu, gazalnu. Another person who's not Jewish makes a fist. The next step, go to the doctor and check your nose out. But when the Jew makes a fist... He immediately begins to confess. I'm sorry for existing. I'm sorry for winning. I'm sorry for being triumphant. Jewish pride. You see, anti-Semitism had two casualties. Casualty number one is it created non-Jews who despise Jews, but it had a second casualty. And sometimes it's more dangerous than the first. Anti-Semitism created Jews who started to hate Jews. Self-hating Jews. I once heard from Dr. Tversky, he was on a plane, dressed like a Hasidic Jew, long black coat, square white beard, round black hat, a Jewish woman sitting near him turns to him and begins to address him in Yiddish. Ashanda, she said, a disgrace. Why can't you people dress like everybody else? Why can't you behave like everybody else? Why can't you be fully integrated with mass culture and they will begin to love us and enjoy us and like us? But because you are determined to stand out, you evoke and inspire their ire and their hatred to us. Genug, enough! Become normal! And he looked at her and naively responded and said in a perfect English accent, he said, excuse me, ma'am, I fail to comprehend your verbiage. Perhaps you're mistaking me for somebody else, but I am Amish. She said, ah, I'm so sorry. I thought you were Hasidic. No, I'm Amish. Wow, she said, I really respect the Amish. <laughs> Why so, did he ask? Because notwithstanding their being a minority, they still maintain their heritage with such pride and dignity. Kol HaKavod! God bless them. Now it was his turn to respond in Yiddish. Aha, he said. Oi, bichwald given Amish. Vostum gehat. If I would have been Amish, you would have cherished me, loved me. But because I am Jewish, you are embarrassed. So I want to bless you. That that which you appreciate in other people, you should be able to appreciate in your own. 
A rabbi once related how shortly after the fall of communism, a woman approached him and said, you know, I was walking down the street and some Russians who wanted to insult me saw me and screamed, Jid, a derogatory term, Jew, to embarrass me. I felt horrible. Here I thought I was just a regular human being. What do I do about it? And the rabbi, who happened actually to be a Chabad rabbi, responded well. He said, you know, interesting thing. I also walk down the same streets, and I look the part. I look Jewish. I wear a kippah, a yarmulke. I have a beard. I have tzitzis. And yet nobody ever screamed jid. Why not? She thought for a moment, and she said, I think I know the reason. When they see me, they want to insult me. They don't like Jews. They want to insult me. They want to denigrate me. And they ask themselves, how can they denigrate me in the street? And they figure out that by screaming, they will insult me. And you know what? They're right. I get embarrassed. I get self-conscious. I feel awkward and uncomfortable. Then they look at you walking down the street. And they think to themselves, mm, we would like to insult him too. How? Shall we scream, Jid? If we scream, Jid, he'll take it as a compliment. <laughs> And therefore, they don't scream, Jid. You see, the great challenge of the modern Jewish state is that when you have only a state, a strong army, thank God, but lacking the inner Jewish dignity that comes from an education and an understanding of what a Jew is and what Judaism is. Ultimately, you can be defeated because you become embarrassed, ashamed, self-conscious. It's hard today to find a Jewish leader, a Jewish politician, a Jewish statesman, who at a press conference, when asked, aren't you occupiers? Aren't you foreign occupiers? Would say, in unambiguous, respectful terms, billions of people in the world, Muslims and Christians, believe in the Bible. Look in the Bible and you'll see that the creator of the world, God, took a little land and he gave it to a small nation called the Jewish people. Jews don't like saying it because it sounds too Jewish. So we come up with every excuse in the world why we belong in Israel. Balfour Declaration, United Nations, this one support, that one support. But skin deep, because all of these declarations and resolutions have changed over the years and the same United Nations equated Zionism with racism and so forth. But to speak the truth, coming from a deep place of Jewish pride and dignity about Israel is difficult for so many of us because we lack the roots, the connectedness to our own soul. So Israel experimented with everything. They experimented going to the right. They got criticized. They experimented going to the left. They got stuck. They experimented going to the far left. They got even more stuck to the far right, and they got even more criticized. Frontwards, and it didn't work. Obama got upset. And backwards, and somebody else got upset. They all experimented with everything. And the Rebbe would say, there's one thing Israel has to experiment with, going upwards. Going upwards. Upwards to our own source, our own origin. Upwards to our past, to our history, to our soulful identity, to our God. I think it was Wittgenstein who spoke about the bug trapped in the jar when he tried explaining what philosophy is and said that the bug goes in all directions 
but just fails to look upwards and thus get out of the jar. To be able to really look upwards and inspire that deep sense of Jewish pride and Jewish dignity. The word for holiness in Hebrew is what? Kedusha. What's the antithesis of holiness in Hebrew? Which word? Chol. Chol. Kodesh and Chol. What does Chol mean? The mundane. But what does it literally mean? It means sand. Why is the antithesis of holiness sand? And one of the answers given in Jewish literature is, you can't plant trees in sand. Sand is not a place that contains roots. The sand may be here, but then the wind comes. And whatever you placed here is, as they say, gone with the wind. The sand is here one moment and there the next moment. The opposite of holiness is not always profanity. The opposite of holiness is rootlessness. Not ruthlessness, but rootlessness. When winds are blowing, you need to be able to have roots, not sand. You need to be able to have deep sharashim, deep roots. And every one of us has tremendously deep roots. We have to explore those roots, nurture those roots, nourish those roots. Those roots are thousands of years old, hundreds and hundreds of generations. Those roots are there. So Israel, the Rebbe understood, must have a soul, a spirit, a spirit rooted in Jewish identity, Jewish consciousness, Jewish faith, and Jewish roots. And only then can the Jews pursue a peace that's not based on shame, on self-denigration, and on self-criticism. And this is an important message today when there's so much anti-Semitism today. The Rebbe would say, make sure that if your child ever hears the word jid, he or she should see it as a compliment. Because if the world will ever come to respect the Jewish people, it will be Jews who respect themselves. If the Jews will ever come to love the Jewish people, it will be till Jews who love themselves. It's hard to respect or love people who hate themselves. It's hard to appreciate people who don't appreciate themselves. And this comes only through education, study, learning, expanding our horizons and opening ourselves up to what it means to be a Yid, to what it means to be a Jew. L'chaim, l'chaim v'levracha. L'chaim. Please join us with the next lovely Hasidic melody, not to interrupt, but to harmonize. Jesus.
Good evening and good chaydesh to one and all, dear friends, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, here in the Crystal Plaza in Livingston, New Jersey. 
dear friends from all over the globe, literally, from Guatemala City to Zurich, from Gold Coast to Naperville, and everybody in between, from Columbus, Ohio, to Haifa, welcome. We are thrilled to be with you. As one person with one heart on this special evening dedicated to the soul and the song of the people in the commemoration of the 15th yard site of one of the great leaders and teachers of our generation, the Lubavitcher So we attempted to convey, at least briefly, some of the ideas of the Rebbe in response to the three great transformations of our past century. The transformation created as a result of a new secularization that redefined Jewish identity. The transformation as a result of the unspeakable destruction and horror of the Shoah and the transformation created by the blessed reality of Eretz Yisrael of Israel, but as every blessing which comes with its own unique challenges, difficulties, and also opportunities. And here we are. Here we are today. There is, however, a common denominator which defines all of the above three responses. And it's this common denominator I want to address here at this moment. In one of the most faithful and enigmatic and mysterious moments in the Hebrew Bible, Jacob, our father, wrestles with a mysterious man in the portion of Ayishlach in Genesis. Jacob remains alone in the middle of the night and a man wrestled with him till dawn broke. And when dawn breaks, the man sees he cannot kill Jacob, so he decides at least to maim him. He wounds, he creates a wound in his uh, sciatic nerve, as a result of which Yaakov, Jacob, begins to limp. And Jacob holds on to him, and the man tells Jacob, Shalcheni, send me away, leave me alone. Ki Allah hashachar, dawn has, I will not send you away. Ki im beirachtani. Until you bless me. I will not send you away until you bless me. And the man ends up blessing him. He asks him for his name. He says, Jacob. And he says, your name should not be Jacob. Your name should be... Your name should be Yisrael. But I want to ask you a question. Imagine somebody is wrestling with you all night in a dark alley. Somebody is wrestling with you all night in a dark alley, trying to kill you, trying to destroy you. You hold on to him, and he says, leave me alone. And you say, I'm not going to leave you alone. So I would expect, till I call the police. <laughs> Jacob says, no, I will not leave you alone till you bless me. I need a blessing from you. But it is here where we come face to face with one of the great secrets of Jewish history. In almost every generation, we are confronted in the middle of the night by a mysterious man 
who wants to defeat us. This is true of us collectively and individually. We, the Jewish people, face in each generation that person who wants to destroy us. May it be Ahmadinejad in Tehran or the various Ahmadinejads that still exist in our midst. That's collectively, but then there is individually as well. Each person, each person sitting here, each person with us, each person in the world has their own mysterious demon, skeleton, ghost, which appears in the middle of the night and wants to defeat you. And if he or she may not be able to kill you, God forbid, and destroy you, at least they can make you limp. At least they can paralyze you. At least they can make you walk slower. At least they can make you become smaller in stature, smaller in dignity, weaker in strength, weaker in resolve and in determination. Comes our father Jacob and he says, the great secret of Judaism and of Jewish history is not only that you fight and you don't let go, but that ultimately you turn to your adversary, that you turn to that force which serves as your opponent. And you say, I will not send you away. Only if you bless me. Which means the Jew is determined to find in every crisis the seeds of a new blessing. In every difficult and challenging moment, he or she observes the birth of a new horizon, of a new dawn. It's not just, I'll send you away, I'm alive. I will not send you away until you bless me. I am determined to see crisis as opportunity. They tell the story of a king who summoned a Jewish artist. And he said, I need you to draw a portrait of me. Two conditions. Number one, I must appear handsome in the portrait. Number two, it must be accurate. The problem, of course, the two were mutually exclusive. The king had a horrible blemish in his eyebrow, on top of his eye. So the Jewish artist faced a predicament. If the portrait will be accurate, he won't appear so handsome. If he's to appear handsome, it won't be accurate. Vos Titman, what do you do? Now in the good old days with these monarchs, if you do not fulfill his request, you can come out with a head shorter. <laughs> what do you do? Mr. Jewish artist went home. And he drew this beautiful, he drew this, he drew this beautiful painting of this king. Engaged in deep thought and meditation. And thus, the hand of the king was right over his eye. Deeply engrossed in thought. He presented the portrait to the king, who felt so honored and respected. Wow, how this Jew respects my intellect and my cognitive abilities. He rewarded him five times the amount he planned to reward him. And so the portrait was both accurate and the king appeared handsome. What was the talent? What was the skill? He took the problem and he turned it into the opportunity. The problem was a blemish above his eye. From that itself, he redefined the situation. Ah, I'll have my king displayed as an intellectual, as a man of great wisdom. Rabbi Akiva. We spoke of Rabbi Akiva. The Talmud says about Rabbi Akiva, one more thing. This is the Talmud in Tractate Menachus, 
page 29b. When Moses comes up to the mountain and he sees God writing the Torah scroll, God, on top of seven letters, wrote what we call tagim. If you know how a Torah scroll looks, there are seven letters in a Torah scroll, and on top of each of those seven letters, there are small, thin lines, which are, look like little thorns. They're called tagim or koitzin. And Rabbi Mo Moses asked God, who are these lines for? Who is going to appreciate them? Who will study them? And God told Moses, one day there will be a Jew whose name is Akiva, the son of Joseph, Akiva ben Yosef. Al kol koitz koitz, asid lidroish tile tilim shalalachis. On each one of those lines and thorns, he will expound mounds upon mounds of Jewish law. What is the meaning of this Talmudic statement? Homiletically, there was an interpretation once presented by Rabbi Yosha Ber, Rabbi J.B. Soloveitchik, who said, Where did Rabbi Akiva get the courage to do what he did? Wasn't Papus right? How do you stand up to a Roman Empire which literally controlled the human, human civilization, controlled the world? And Rome decreed no Jewish study. Rome was determined to uproot every remnant of Jewish life, Jewish spirituality, and Jewish learning and observance. Rabbi Akiva was a single man who defied the dominant empire of the time and created a whole generation of students, 24,000 Jewish students. When such courage... When such vision, when such inner power, and he paid the greatest price, he was executed, he was murdered. On this, God showed Moses Rabbi Akiva's approach. Rabbi Akiva's approach was, I'll call koitz v'koitz, tilei tilim shalalachis. Koitz means a thorn. In the context of the discussion of the Talmud, it's referring to the little thorns on top of seven letters in the Torah. Little lines, they're like little Zions. But it also means, Rabbi Soloveitchik said, a literal thorn. God told Moses, you want to know the uniqueness of Rabbi Akiva? I'll call koitz v'koitz for every thorn with which Rome perforates the body of Jewish existence. What is Rabbi Akiva's response to each of those thorns? Mounds and mounds of halacha. For every thorn that he observed, with which the Romans penetrated and attempted to undermine Klal Yisro, each thorn became for him a catalyst and a springboard to create another halacha, a new law, a new yeshiva, a new center of study, a new idea, a new concept, a new feeling. For every thorn with which the Romans perforated the Jewish soul and the Jewish body, Rabbi Akiva said, my response, our response is going to be, we're going to rebuild halacha, Jewish law. In our generation too, we have our thorns. And when the Rebbe became the leader of Chabad in 1950, he observed not only a nation devastated by thorns, but a nation actually reduced to ashes. Not figuratively, but literally. Mounds and mounds, not of halacha, mounds and mounds of ashes. The ashes of the six million. Kedoshim utahirim, kedoshayalian, the holiest of the sacred. From Rabbi Akiva, he learned this message. Kol koitz v'koitz. Every thorn must serve as a catalyst to create a new mound of Allah. The Germans destroyed thousands of shuls and yeshivas and batim adrashim. Our task then is not only to rebuild the same number, but to double them and triple them and quadruple them. 
They destroyed six million. And therefore every Jew ought to do everything he or she can, can to rebuild the Jewish people. Quantitatively and qualitatively. We lack six million, he would say, every Jew must see himself or herself as a representative, not of himself, but at least of a hundred Jews, or maybe of a thousand Jews. When you wake up and you look in the mirror, the Rebbe said, you can't look at yourself as a small, insignificant person. You have to see yourself as an ambassador of 10,000 Jews, 20,000 Jews who were left in Auschwitz and can't speak. You become their mouthpiece. You become their heart. You become their voice. You carry their torch, their baton, their light, their power. I'll call kites the kites for every thorn with which Hitler and Stalin perforated the Jewish people, he said. We have to use it as a springboard and a catalyst to create an unprecedented Jewish renaissance, a rejuvenation as in J.E.W., a resurrection of the Jewish spirit, Jewish soul, Jewish study, and Jewish life, here and in the Holy Land and in the rest of the world. It's not enough just to let the adversary go and say, ah, I'm here. But rather, I will not let you go until you bless me. I need to find in every crisis the opportunity. And this is true psychologically as well. Whenever you face a challenging moment in your life, a crisis in your life, deep in that crisis, as difficult as it is, the Rebbe taught, there is an energy, a powerful energy, which is a blessing. It just comes eclipsed as a challenge and sometimes as a curse. But it's your power to redefine its context and to redefine its meaning. Think about your own life. I could think about my own life and we know that moments that were extremely painful, haunting, challenging and scary, often carried within themselves in a dormant and latent fashion, the greatest potential for our growth. And if we use them that way, we then had the ability to look at ourselves in a new way, to appreciate parts of ourselves which we have not seen before, to go deeper beneath the surface and beneath the external layers. And thus, to each of the three challenges of the last century, whether it was the challenge of the fox taking Jews out of the Holy of Holies secularization, whether it was the unspeakable challenge of destruction, and whether it was the great military, military, military and cultural challenges and security challenges of the land of Israel, the Rebbe, loyal to that story of Jacob, loyal to that story of Rabbi Akiva, understood our greatest calling always is to see opportunity where others only see crisis and to see the potential for growth where others may only see doom and to look at the end of an era also as the beginning of a new one and to be able to identify a difficult and a challenging moment as an opportunity to create a new awareness and to create a new identity. Don't let go of that angel until he blesses you. Don't let go of that crisis until that itself is transformed into a new opportunity for a new awareness, for a new consciousness, and for a new growth. Today, nine years after the beginning of a new century, we too face various thorns. And our approach too must be to remember not to let them go until they don't bless us. L'chaim.
L'chaim, l'chaim v'levracha. Tayir Eden. L'chaim, l'chaim to life. L'chaim to your health. L'chaim to your happiness. L'chaim to your well-being. All of you and all of those who are here with us via the web and all of our Jewish brothers and sisters and all good people in the world. May God bless all of you with tremendous blessings materially and spiritually. L'chaim, l'chaim, and everything that your heart dreams and desires. L'chaim. There was a Jew, a rabbi who was once walking on the second avenue in Manhattan. It started to pour and he didn't have an umbrella. So he went into the nearby building. Little did he know it was a cathedral. And it was Sunday morning and there were 2,000 people sitting. So he sat down. (laughs) At some point the priest turns to the audience and says, whoever would like to enter into the kingdom of heaven shall rise now. And 2,000 people, of course, rose, besides one person, the Jew. <laughs> and the priest sees there's one person sitting, he turns to me, he says, hey, yeah, tell me, why don't you rise? Don't you want to enter into the kingdom of heaven? And the rabbi says, Father, sure I do, but what's the rush? <laughs> Which, of course, brings to mind the classic one about the Jewish, the rabbi, and the priest, and the minister who meet in Starbucks for a latte for 9.50. I don't know how much they cost in Livingston. I don't know how much they cost in the city. What are you going to talk in Starbucks? about, they discuss what they would like to hear people say at their funeral. The priest says, I would like to hear people say at my funeral, he was a true servant of the Lord. He introduced the light of the Lord into countless lives. The minister says, I would like to hear people say, he was a real friend, you could rely on him. In a moment of need, you had somebody to call. Rabbi, how about you? What would you like to hear people say at your funeral? And the rabbi says, you know, I would like to hear somebody say at my funeral, I think he's moving. (laughs) It's in light of these anecdotes that I raise to you and I present to you the following deeply enigmatic statement and story of the Talmud. The Talmud in Tractate Ksuvus, page 104, Kuv Dalad Aleph, 104a, relates the story of the passing of one of the greatest luminaries of Jewish history, Rabbi Judah the Prince, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, 
he is known in such reverence that we refer to him as Rebbe. In Jewish literature, when you call somebody Rebbe, it refers to Rabbi Yehuda, the author of the Mishnah, the editor of the Mishnah, who lived in the second century after the common era. Rebbe, Rabbi Yehuda, was very ill, suffered tremendous agony during his illness. He was struggling for his life, holding on for his life. The rabbis, the sages, were praying and studying for his health. And the Talmud says in Tractate Ksuvas the following statement. The rabbis and the sages, the contemporaries and the students of Rebbe declared that anyone who comes forth and states, Noch nafshei de Rebbe, Rebbe died, Yidokir becherev, should be pierced with a sword. They sent a colleague whose name was Bar Kapora to go examine Rebbe's health, his state of being. And he went into the home and he discovered that Rebbe indeed passed on. He returns fearful of telling them the news. He put it in different words. He said, friends, there was a conflict, there is a war. There was a war going on between the angels on high and the righteous men below. One of them would win. The angels above wanted to triumph and claim Rebbe for themselves and the righteous people below wanted Rebbe for themselves. Nitzchu ar elim es hametsukim. The angels above came out triumphant over the tzaddikim, the righteous men below. The sages turned to him and said, Do you mean to say Rebbe died? And he said, You said it, not I. And that's the end of the story. What is the meaning of this statement? Whoever says, Noch nafshe de Rebbe, Rebbe's soul passed on, Yedaka Becherov should be perforated, should be stabbed with a sword. Rebbe was very ill. He was very sick. Where were they living? In a lala land? In a fantasy world? What did they mean? Kill the messenger in the old Greek tradition? As though it's the messenger's fault? What did they mean? There are many different interpretations. The Marsha, one of the Talmudic commentators. But I want to share with you an insight given by the Chassam Soifer. Chassam Soifer, Reb Moshe Schreiber, was the rabbi of Pressburg, who was in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Today it's Bratislava. The Chassam Soifer gives the following interpretation, similar to an interpretation given by a contemporary of his, a little younger, the Sar Shalom of Bells. The great tzaddik, the Helikas Sar Shalom of Bells. And they say this. The Talmud says at the end of Tractate Brachas, Talmidei Chachamim Ein Lehem Enucha Loi Ba'elam Hazav Loi Ba'elam Haba. Torah scholars don't have rest, not in this world, and not in the coming world. It's not like when they die, when they pass on, finally, now they go on vacation. They don't have serenity and tranquility, not in this world, and also not in the future world. Why? Because if they're real Torah leaders, they are so connected to their students, to their disciples, to their people, that even in the next world, in the world to come, in paradise, they don't rest. They don't find souls, they don't find comfort because they are deeply intertwined and interconnected with each one of their people who remains here below, participating in his fate and destiny, praying on his behalf, experiencing what their disciples are going through and trying to help change the situation. This is what the sages meant. Whoever will say, Noch nafshe de Rebbe, the soul of Rebbe will have menucha, will have serenity 
and tranquility when it dies. His agony, his torment will cease. Finally, he will reach a place of tranquility, of comfort. Whoever says, Nach naf shedi Rebbe, Rebbe will be relaxed. Rebbe will be able to go on vacation. Finally, he died. He left this world of misery. Yidoke Bechera. He doesn't understand who Rebbe is. He doesn't understand who Rabbi Yudah Anasi is. Rabbi Yudah Anasi, a true leader of the Jewish people, he will not find rest or solace and comfort after he passes away. He doesn't leave this world and go into an oasis, a transcendental cocoon of majestic purity, and says, goodbye, evil world. Catch you later. See you on the other side. That's not Rebbe. A Rebbe. A real master, a real teacher, never abandons his people, never abandons his flock, never really bids farewell to his nation. To say, Nach nafshe di Rebbe, the soul of Rebbe will be Nach, will finally graduate from its agony, is a complete distortion of who Rebbe is. And furthermore, Yidakir Becherev, he will be perforated with a sword because the rabbis tell us the voice is the voice of Jacob. And the hands are the hands of Esau. Hakol kol Yaakov ayadai midei Esau. Esau, Jacob, Isaac told him, Al char you live on your sword. So the Talmud says, as long as the voice of Jacob persists, the sword of Esau is weakened. The moment the voice of Jacob is impoverished, the sword of Esau is increased. And so, somebody who says, Nach naf Rebbe, somebody who really believes that Rebbe's soul came to rest, came to a place where it's not working any longer. We were just graduated from this world and now found serenity. Yidakir Becherev will subject himself and his people to the sword of Esau because Rebbe was a contemporary of Antoninus, of Antony, the Roman emperor, one a descendant of Jacob, Rebbe, and one a descendant of Esau. As long as Rebbe functions and operates, the sword of Esau is weakened. If you say, Nach nafshe de Rebbe, the soul of Rebbe, is not functioning anymore, you subject yourself, Yidake Becherev, to the sword, to the sword of Esau. This, I think, applies to our gathering and our evening as well. Nach nafshe de Rebbe, the Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe was restless in his life. You know, Shabbos afternoon, Jews have a nice custom to go to sleep. They eat a good cholent, a good kog kugel, some good kishke, and then the forces of gravity pull them down to a great Shabbos shloth, as Jews in New Jersey know very well, and Jews all over the world. Where I grew up in Crown Heights, there was no concept of sleeping on Shabbos. The Rebbe didn't sleep himself, nor did he allow any others, anybody else to sleep. He believed that as long as we are in exile, we're in Gullus, there's no room to sleep. There's no room for real vacation and relaxation. Of course, we love making believe that we know how to go on vacation and relax. But as you know, Jews on vacation usually have a very difficult time relaxing. Right? It's like when you go out to eat in a Jew. The other day somebody tells me he was in a Jewish kosher restaurant and the waiter was going around from table to table and asking one question. Is anything all right? There's a restlessness. There's a restlessness at the core of the Jew. Some of us try to run away from that restlessness. The Rebbe felt that that restlessness is actually indicative of a genuine spark that the Jew knows that he or she is empowered to change the world and to turn crisis into opportunity and to take every kites and every thorn and transform it into a mound of halacha and felt that all of the upheavals of the last century discussed at length above, and all of the upheavals of this new century 
are essentially birth pangs, which are there to lead the world to a new place, to the era of Mashiach, of redemption. And that's the main objective of the Jew. It's not a fairy tale or a fantasy idea, but actually something to fight for, something to work for, to change the consciousness of the world, to change the consciousness of the Jewish people, to permeate it with a consciousness of godliness, of depth, of meaning, of love, of a certain selflessness, of a camaraderie, of a deep unity, to be able to graduate and transcend our pettiness, our narcissism, our differences, and to be able to see all of the tremendous upheavals as a preparation for something really grand, which in Judaism we call Mashiach. This was his dream, and he never stopped. Never stopped inspiring himself, inspiring other people. And then the Rebbe passed on 15 years ago. For Chabad, naturally, it was a crisis, a very difficult moment, a very challenging moment. Their relationship and connection to the Rebbe was very deep. But I think today we could say clearly those words the sages said how long ago, 1800 years ago, in the times of Rebbe. That you can't say, Noch nafshe de Rebbe. In a way, worse than the passing of Rebbe Yehuda is to say that he passes on, and Noch nafshe, now he reaches relaxation. The Lubavitcher Rebbe didn't leave a legacy. He went to relax in a good, rewarded, in, a, in, in the reward that awaited him. And he left a nice legacy, a beautiful, enriching legacy. The Rebbe didn't leave a legacy. The Rebbe left marching orders. Marching orders to finish a task, to complete a task. And to say, Noch nafshe de Rebbe, Rebbe's soul is serene and tranquil in another world, is a misunderstanding of the nature of it. The nature of it was infusing selflessly an urgency, a consciousness, within the Jewish world and within every Jew individually to reach in and to reach out and to make a difference, to become a leader, to infuse your corner of the world with the light of Torah, with the light of mitzvahs, with the light of Yiddishkeit and with the light of a higher godly consciousness. Rebbe's soul did not go to rest. And our soul must also not go to rest and to sleep. L'chaim, l'chaim.
Once again, L'chaim, to all of you here and to all of you across the globe, welcome. We are so happy to be joined literally by thousands upon thousands of Jews in hundreds of cities 
around the world. Bruchim haboyim to one and all. Some of you are getting tired, and some of you are ground or grove are just waking up <laughs> to join us. So good morning, and moidaani lefanecha for a nayitog for a new day. I want to make a special achayim and express a special thanks to a couple which dedicated tonight's evening, David and Ida Schattenstein from Columbus, Ohio. L'chaim, l'chaim, l'vrachet to you and to all of you here and abroad and globally l'chaim. The following episode I heard from one of the secretaries of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Yehuda Leib Groner, who shared with me that as a secretary, often individuals would approach the Rebbe and share with him a problem, a crisis, a challenge they were having in their life. And the Rebbe would give a response and answer whatever the answer he chose to give to that person. But this person or that person would frequently repeat the story again. And when this would happen, he tended always to uh, subtly or maybe not so subtly indicate to this person that it's time to move on. He already said what he wanted to say. He shared it with the Rebbe. The Rebbe heard. The Rebbe responded the way he wanted to respond. Why are you repeating it again? But do you know how the nature of people, they would sit and dwell on it, dwell on it and repeat it again? So he pushed them away. And he told me that once, the Rebbe told them afterwards and said, why do you uh, push these people away? So he told the Rebbe, they, they said what they wanted to say. The Rebbe heard, the Rebbe responded. And why should they waste and squander the Rebbe's time and just repeat the story again? So that's why I asked them to leave, to move on. And the Rebbe told them these words. He said, when a Jew comes to me and shares a problem, Shares a challenge he or she is having in their personal life or in an aspect of their life. And they share it, they express it to me. Gate by Zayarop, a stein von hearts, and he said in Yiddish, a stone is removed from their heart. When they repeat the story again to me, noch a stein geht herab von hearts, another stone gets removed from their heart. And when they repeat it a third time, is Nachashtein. Another stone gets removed from their heart. They share it with me. I hear it. He says, Is Vas Ardir. So why do you care to allow Jews to remove the stones from their hearts by sharing the story with me, if not once, twice, and three times? And it reminded me of another episode. The Rebbe had a custom, he had a tradition. He would open all the mail himself. I don't know if you know. Imagine a person receives five or six or seven or eight hundred letters a day. And each envelope, the Rebbe would open himself. He would not allow his secretaries to open the envelopes for him. And Rabbi Groner told me that once there was a radio personality who came to see the Rebbe. And when he went into the secretary's office and he saw the pile of mail, of envelopes, and he asked, what's this? And Rabbi Groner said, this is going into the Rebbe. And he said, I have three secretaries opening my mail. And he doesn't have a secretary to open his mail. And the secretary of the Lubavitcher Rebbe said, he doesn't let us open the mail. He said, why not? You know how long? I mean, he would, he would gain so much time. So Rabbi Grona said, you're going, to go, you're going to go into the Rebbe, ask him. And when he came out, he told Rabbi Grona, don't you dare open the mail. <laughs> so he asked him, he said, what happened? 
<laughs> so the radio personality told them, I went into the Lubavitcher Rebbe, and I said, I don't understand you. I have three secretaries opening my mail. Why don't you allow your secretary to open your envelopes to make your life easier? You have to open hundreds and hundreds of envelopes a day by yourself. It's not enough that you have to read them and respond to them. You have to open them. You have to open them too. And the Rebbe responded and he said, What do most of the people write about? I receive lots of letters. So often the letters are about problems in a relationship, in a marriage. Or problems in the relationship between parents and children. Or children and parents. Or people, or friends, or communities, or spouses. Conflict, wars, arguments, disputes. And they come and they seek my advice. The Rebbe said, it's bad enough that I have to know their secrets. You want me now to allow my secretaries to also know their secrets. It's hard enough that I have to be exposed to the private intimate information in their life. You want other people to also know and be privy to this information. So he says, but Rabbi, the secretaries will anyway become aware of what's going on because when you answer the letter, you give it to them and they're going to see. Have an idea. You see the scissor on the table? When I write the answer, I cut out the letter and I just leave the signature and my answer so that my secretaries never see what they wrote to me. They only know that this answer has to be given to this person with this signature, and they don't know what they wrote. And that way, I respect and retain the confidentiality of each person. So when he came out, he told Rabbi Grona, don't you dare open any envelopes. Because he was in awe of that type of sensitivity and that type of respect. Once, this I heard from somebody else, a Lubavitcher chassid decided to buy the Rebbe an electric envelope opener. <laughs> if he wants to open the envelopes himself, fine, but at least let him have an electric opener you put in the envelope, and chick chak it opens up. You don't have to sit with your own fingers and tear open every single envelope. He sent it into the Rebbe, and shortly afterwards, the Rebbe returned it. Why, he asked. The answer that came back was, it's too noisy. It generates too much noise. So he went, and after much effort, he found a silent model. It opens envelopes and doesn't make noise. He was overjoyed with his discovery, which did not come easy. And he sent it in to the Lubavitcher Rebbe. A little while later, this too gets returned to him. So now he inquires, why? My high, what now? It's silent, doesn't make any noise. And the answer the Rebbe gave over to him through one of his secretaries was this, not verbatim, but this was the content. You know, different people seal their envelopes in different ways. Some people seal envelopes with the saliva of their mouth. And some seal envelopes with glue or scotch tape or with the natural glue in the envelopes. And then there are those individuals who seal their envelopes with their tears. Willstu ich soll öffnen mit der Maschine was Ayid hat vermacht mit Tränen. Do you want I should open with the machine that which a Jew sealed with his tears? In other words, the machine will not pick up the tears. The machine is insensitive to the tears with which the envelope was sealed. But when I open the envelope with my fingers, with my hands, I open the envelope, I can sense the tears with which the envelope was sealed. And in a way, I can embrace those tears. I can make them a part of mine. And as a result, a stone 
is released from this person's heart, as stated above. And then I heard this from one of the Lubavitcher Rebbe's doctors, Dr. Robert Feldman, who shared with me that one night after the Rebbe suffered a very severe heart attack, it was the night of Shmini Atzeres, 1977, in the middle of a kafas and shul. And upstairs in the room, in his room, there was a debate. Should he go to the hospital or not? The doctors felt he must go to the hospital on Yom Tif, on the holiday. The Rebbe refused. He didn't want to go to the hospital. And Dr. Feldman told me that at one point, the Lubavitcher Rebbe told him, he said, look around this room. You see these tables? You see this desk? You see these books? You see these bookcases? For decades, they have listened to and absorbed countless tears and stories of the Jewish people. This room is a witness. These walls have within themselves decades and decades of stories, of experiences, of emotions, of tears of Jewish souls. That's the power they have in them. If anything is going to heal me, it's going to be this energy that's in this room. And that's why I don't want to leave. There's no nach nafsh the Rebbe. A Rebbe passes on, he doesn't rest. And we don't rest. We continue. This is a calling for each and every one of us. How you could embrace another individual, the tears of a person, the stories of a person, and allow the stone on their heart to be released. And every person has an individual whose agony you can alleviate, whose distress you can eliminate, and whose stones you can help remove, even if only a little bit. There's an interpretation once presented by the Rebbe on that verse concerning Moses, the first Jewish leader. When Moshe comes out in Egypt, first time, what does he see? What is the first image? He sees an Egyptian striking a Jew, beating a Jew to death. And what does Moses do? Vayifen koi v'koi, he turns here, he turns there, he sees there's no man. He strikes the Egyptian dead, he hides him in the sand. What does it mean he turns here and he turns there and he sees there's no man? Was nobody really present? We know that the next day there were informers who saw the whole story. So Rashi and others give different interpretations and explanations. But this is one once presented by the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Moses comes out as a young Egyptian growing up in an Egyptian palace and he sees an Egyptian striking and mercilessly beating a Jew to death. He turns here and he turns there. And he sees there's no human being who cares. It's not that he sees there's no person present. Ki ain't ish. There's no mensch. There's no individual who cares. There's nobody who is perturbed by the fact that an innocent person is being beaten to death. There's nobody who makes a pips. There's nobody who screams. There's nobody who shouts. There's nobody who protests. Nobody cares. And at this moment he has to make a decision. Will I join the masses and say, nobody cares? Why should I care? Everybody is apathetic. Why should I be the only nerd, the only moron to take a stand? July 4th is coming. It's time to go to the Catskills. It's time to go on vacation. It's time to relax. It's time to say goodbye to everything and everybody. It's 
It's time to chill out. Either somebody being beaten physically or conceptually, emotionally or psychologically or literally. Nobody cares. Why should I care? What made Moses Moses, what made Moshe Moshe was, his response was different. He saw nobody cares. Therefore, I must care. Therefore, I must stand up to the plate. Therefore, I must take a stand. Therefore, I must reach out. I must turn the crisis into an opportunity. Save this person. He did so. This is the first story we know about Moses. Why is it the first story we know about him? Because it defines him. And it explains why he was chosen. We live today in a time, sometimes you look at a situation, you look at a reality. Nobody cares. Nobody cares enough to say boo. Nobody cares enough to utter a pips. People wallow in their own orbit. We circle in our own orbit. We live in our own cocoon. And we take care of our own issues. And our own issues are stressful enough. Life is stressful enough if you worry about yourself. And your mortgage. And your tuition bills. And your health insurance. There's enough stress to go around the table. And to go around the block. So now you want me to worry about other people. Noch nafshe de Rebbe. The uniqueness of Rebbe is there's no noch nafshe. He never becomes complacent, never becomes smug. Tamidei chachamim, ein lahem enucha. And this is what Moshe Rabbeinu Moses and Rebbe, and a Rebbe in every generation infuses and instills and inculcates within the Jewish people, disciples, students, and anybody who wishes to listen. That you have a spark of Moses, and when you see there's nobody, so then you and I must stand up and embrace a soul, kindle a spirit, and give solace and comfort to an aching heart. May we emulate this example. L'chaim. L'chaim l'vracha. No, do do one more song.
And so, my dear friends, One of the concepts and the realities that the Rebbe often emphasized and stressed, and not just often, I think at almost every gathering or every assembly, continuously, And I guess was the best living example of it was the preciousness and the necessity of perpetual study and learning. Because as the Talmud says, Ein Ani Elabadas, poverty is in the mind, poverty is in the consciousness. All change happens in das, in a person's awareness, in a person's sense of perception, in a person's sense of reality. We spoke about many a crisis, a crisis of the previous century and crises that continue to this very day on a geopolitical level, on a collective Jewish level, on an individual level. The ability to be able to withstand and to rise up to a crisis and to a difficult era in history with clarity of vision and with determination to turn a crisis into an opportunity only occurs through learning, individual learning. A person continuously studying Torah and enriching and expanding their consciousness and their horizons. You know the famous Midrash, that Korach, in this week's portion, disputes Moses. And the way he disputes Moses, the Midrash says, he comes to Moses and asks a question. Talis shekulat chelas, chayev is or not? Which means, if you have a talis, a prayer shawl, that's completely woven out of turquoise wool, the blue turquoise wool, does it still need fringes, tzitzis, with one thread that is made of turquoise? And Moses said, yeah. And Korach laughed. You have a whole garment that's made out of turquoise, of tchelas. You still need a single strand, a single strand, a single thread in your tzitzis. That's turquoise. The whole garment is blue, is tchelos. And Korach began scoffing at Moses' verdict. A similar question. If you have a home that's filled with Torah scrolls, do you still need a mezuzah on the door? And Moses said, yeah. Korach said, the whole home is filled with Torah scrolls and you need a mezuzah which has two portions of the Bible on the door. Eh. And he began scoffing at Moses. And in one of his talks, the Lubavitch Rebbe explained that this was a deep philosophical debate. Korach was a mystic. And Korach advocated complete spiritual ecstasy. Cover yourself with a prayer shawl filled with turquoise, which reflects the color of the water, the color of the heaven, the color of the throne of glory. Fill your house with many Torah scrolls. And Moses said, it's not enough. You need individualized strands of tchelis, and you need an individual mezuzah. It's not enough just to create a global sense of inspiration and ecstasy and awareness and consciousness. A person needs to be able to have the discipline to make it part of his or her daily life in a very defined and individualistic fashion. 
Sometimes we get inspired, we get awakened, we feel Jewish, we feel holy, we feel uplifted, but it doesn't translate on a daily basis into any individualized action. And the inspiration fades away into oblivion, and the high ends up in a low. Korach was a great mystic and maybe a great philosopher, but Moses was a leader. He understood people. And he understood that when you want to have an impact, it's not enough just to create revolutions. There's also the aftermath. There's the day after. It's not enough just to come to the concert and sing your heart out and scream your soul out. But then the lights go out and everybody goes home. And the next morning you go back to the same thing. You need to be able to take the turquoise and translate it into a single strand, into a single tzitzah. In other words, turn it into a pragmatic, concrete reality that makes a difference if only a small difference. And reduce it to two chapters that are there at the door when you go out to work and to the street and when you come home. And this, I think, is true today as well. That each and every one of us has the power and the calling to be able to take one element of our life, maybe a strand, maybe a little parchment, a little mezuzah, and make it holier, make it more refined. That means if I, on a daily basis, introduce a few moments of Torah study, it may be a few moments, it may be small, it may look insignificant, it may be a single strand, but this ultimately makes all the difference. And this was the debate between Korach and between Moses. Korach believed, let's change the whole world. And Moses said, you change the world by changing one person at a time, one mitzvah at a time, one day at a time, one action at a time, in a pragmatic, in a realistic way. This too is our calling today. L'chaim, l'chaim, v'levracha. Ta'ira b'li.